for a successful solutions architect to be technically strong is only half the job. Because an SA needs to work across the organization, from senior management to the development team, soft skills are critical. But what soft skills must a solutions architect have? Well, that's exactly what we're going to cover in this episode with the help of none other but the Solutions Architect Handbook. By the end of the episode, you will know about the various soft skills required for an SA to succeed in the role. My name is Ilyas and I'm a Senior Solutions Architect. Now let's do this. In the pre-sales phase, one collects detailed information to make a buy-in decision. From customer's organization's perspective, you will be involved as an SA in the pre-sales phase to validate technology from various vendors. Now, from the vendor's organization's perspective, meaning if you're an SA at AWS, GCP, or any other cloud provider, you will need to respond to customer's questions and present a potential solution that covers their needs. It then becomes evident that pre-sales requires a unique skill set that combines strong technical knowledge with soft skills. One of these crucial skills is communication and negotiation. Because a good essay is a liaison between the sales and technical teams, which makes communication and coordination crucial skills. Let us examine the importance of communication through an excerpt from the Solutions Architect Handbook. Solutions Architect need to have excellent communication skills to engage the customer with the correct and latest details. Presenting precise details on the solution and industry relevance helps customers understand how your solution can address their business concerns. The authors touch also on the importance of negotiation skills in another paragraph. Solutions architects also need to create agreements by collaborating with customers and internal teams, which requires excellent negotiation skills in particular. Strategic level decisions have significant impact across multiple groups. Put in other words, the pre-sales aspect requires you to include the business demands in your suggested solutions, but also manage their expectations. For example, you'll probably suggest, after gathering requirements from all stakeholders, that the best course of action is to focus on building specific tools in the first phase that will allow the engineering teams to release features faster once these common tools have been delivered. And this brings us to another imperative aspect of the job, listening and problem solving skills. See, you are hired to bring solutions. It's in the name. But before solution comes the requirements gathering through active listening and asking the right questions. Example, you're working with an organization that wants to build a live chat platform for their own customers. Now it's easy to jump on the whiteboard and start designing a solution, thinking about PubSub, thinking about WebSockets, thinking about how to squeeze the best performance, building these layers using a compiled language, something like Golang or Java. But should you not ask the right question, you would probably miss the fact that their development teams have the intention to write this solution using Laravel framework because that's the only in-house expertise. You might argue with them that performance is important and using this language or this technology is their best chance. But you know what? They might be more focused on cost based on their application's user base. As follows, the solutions architect needs to understand the gaps and needs to provide the right solution per their customer's primary key performance indicator goal. Now, before we get to the third skill, I would love it if you take a moment to hit the like button and show the algorithm you are liking this type of content. It helps the channel tremendously, which in returns allow me to bring you more similar content. Thank you very much. Soft skill number three. Now, believe it or not, I learned my fair share about presentations from YouTube. Yes, YouTubers. All of us, with no exception, are competing for your attention. We rewrite our scripts multiple times and choose our words carefully to tailor them to our audience. We choose effects like these. 
to keep you engaged. Even my background music is not chosen randomly. The words I put on the screen are carefully chosen to put emphasis on the idea I want to convey. Introductions are crucial. We give you a glimpse of our content as early as possible so you know what to expect. Some YouTubers like Mr. Beast or Tommy Innit are masters of suspense creating cliffhangers every 30 seconds. You just can't click away. Every second is important when it comes to YouTube. Now I'm not making this about how to become a successful YouTuber. I'm myself still learning this craft, but I can definitely make a full episode about things I use to build engaging presentations that convey ideas in the most captivating way. So just let me know in the comments if that's something you'd be interested in. For now, I'm mentioning these ideas because one of the most challenging tasks in your job as an SA could be to get executive buy-in. Senior executives, such as the Chief Executive Officer, CEO, Chief Technology Officer, CTO, Chief Financial Officer, CFO, and Chief Information Officer, CIO, are regarded as C-level as they have a tight schedule and need to make lots of high-impact decisions. As a solutions architect, you may have lots of details to present, but your C-level meetings are very time-bound. Here, a solutions architect needs to get the maximum value out of their meeting in the allocated time slot. There's an excerpt in the Solutions Architect Handbook that I want to go through here. Quote, the primary question is, how do we get senior executives' attention and support in a limited time? Often, during any presentation, people tend to put a summary slide at the end, while in the case of executive meetings, your time may further reduce as per their priority and agenda. The key to an executive presentation is to summarize the primary points upfront in the first five minutes. You should prepare in such a way that if your 30-minute slot reduces to five minutes, you should still be able to convey your point and get buy-in before the next step. Now, this is a piece of great advice. Don't try to present everything in detail. Some information may seem relevant from your perspective, but maybe it doesn't make much sense for an executive audience. I can't tell you the number of times I've been in meetings where an essay was so focused on the benefits from the technical implementation that they bored senior management who were there hoping to learn more about return on investment and how this specific solution can reduce their operational overhead and how it can increase their productivity. I know this whole thing might seem obvious and some people might tell you that content is king. Unfortunately, it's not. Not always, anyways. Bringing this back to YouTube, how many channels with strong and well-researched content are just enabled to get to their audience? I know a few. So I want you to spend as much time preparing the form of your presentation as preparing its content. I, for example, rarely give presentations to engineers. I prefer to do live whiteboarding sessions with them because I know we will have to go back and forth on some aspects. We will have to replace components in favor of another one and sometimes on the spot because some requirements I wasn't aware of. Right? So if I'm presenting to a C-level, I prepare to answer questions like how will the proposed solution benefit their customers? How their competitors might react to this solution? What happens if they keep their current solution and do nothing? I also found some other interesting questions in the book where the authors go in detail about how to answer them. So make sure to check the book for how best to address these type of questions. And I'll leave a link in the description where you can still get a 15% discount on the book from amazon.com. Now let's talk about skill number four. Let's talk about thinking big, shall we? One of Amazon's leadership principles is think big with the following definition. Thinking small is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Leaders create and communicate a bold direction that inspires results. They think differently and look around corners for ways to serve customers. As a former AWS solutions architect myself, I know I wouldn't be able to work with my customers forever. You know, I loved my job, of course, but 
Challenge is the only constant thing in life. So I would always try to think ahead when I'm working with a customer and see the big picture in order to create a foundation upon which my customer puts building blocks, launching their immediate product, but also maintaining it easily for years to come. You will hear me say again and again and again and again in the channel that building a solution that can be maintained for decades is the hardest thing to do. Building a solution that works in contrast, is super easy. Thinking big doesn't mean you need to make a very unrealistic goal. After all, every technology is but a step to the next technology. And none of us really know what the future will bring. We can try to predict, sure, but we humans predict in a linear fashion. We take what we have now and we just try to improve on it. Because we now have smartphones, we predict that the future of smartphones will be glass smartphones or very thin, very energy efficient smartphones. But someone might invent a new communication protocol that uses, I don't know, brainwaves? And suddenly smartphones become obsolete. People, after all, wanted faster horses, as the legend goes. But as a group of people invented something called a car, horses just became obsolete. And because we had cars, people in the 70s and the 80s predicted that by 2020, we would have flying cars. Because we had balloons, people predicted that we will have balloon-supported lake walking in the future. Because we used brooms, then the future must be automated brooms, right? but we ended up using vacuums to clean floors. So that's a fork in the road. It's not an improvement on what we had. Because mailmen delivered mail, well, the future must be a jetpack mailman, right? As amusing as I find these future predictions of the past, I have to stop here and take a step back. Designing a future-proof solution is about flexibility, modularity, and avoiding tight coupling. Keep that in mind next time you start designing a solution. Now, I will stop the video here Let's start a discussion around it. Do you agree? Don't you agree? If you got value from this video and you like it, please let me know and I will make a second part of it where I will address four other soft skills that I think are super important for the job of a solutions architect. But if you like to know more about the daily life of a solutions architect, you will want to watch this video where you follow me in all my activities during the day. Until the next one, take care of yourselves. Peace out.